My brothers and sisters in Christ, so far this week I haven't offered any comment on our series of first readings, which this week come from the book of Tobit. The book of Tobit is one that's one of the least well-known books of the Old Testament uh, uh, amongst Catholics, but especially outside of Catholics. Why? Because it's one of the deuterocanonical books known by Protestants as apocryphal books, uh, ones that's not included in a lot of Protestant Bibles. This is due to its sourcing. It's a very late uh, Old Testament book. Uh, while there have been fragments at Qumran found that suggest it may have indeed be, have been composed in Aramaic, the, the early copies floating were in Greek, which was why they, it was excluded uh, from the, the canon that later Jews used. But regardless of this background of the origin of the Book of Tobit, it's a very colorful story that uh, is one a lot of people consider it as more folklore than true history, uh, and even though it gives kind of some historical context of people and places, one that mostly builds upon themes uh, of wisdom themes uh, that are pre prevalent in the, the Old Testament. Regardless of the historicity of the events itself, today in the, the first reading we hear a, a section that is one of the options we hear at weddings sometimes that couples choose. And they often choose, and uh, the, the reading selection for the weddings isn't the full first reading that we hear today, just the section of the prayer of bride and groom in the, in the, the bridal chamber the night that they are wed. And in that context, if you know nothing else, it's a beautiful prayer. Husband and wife fall to their knees side by side and pray to God for his protection over them. This makes it very appealing to bride and grooms until you tell them the context of the story. The context of the story, as we hear, is that Sarah, the poor woman, has been afflicted by a demon who she's, her, her father's attempted to marry her seven different times, seven different men, each of whom were killed on their wedding night by the demon before they could consummate the marriage. And so Sarah is something of a pariah in great misery. And the, the story, and I'll, I'll talk uh, in, a, in a couple days more about some broad themes of the book, but all the more, the, the theme in the book of Tobit is that the, the Archangel Raphael in disguise comes to intervene for two different prayer requests that are made heartily, that of Sarah and her affliction, and also from Tobit himself, uh, as he has suffered a lot of misfortune and is now blinded. And in response to both of these prayers, a story unfolds in which the needs of two different families are interwoven. The response to that prayer is found, and this culminates with, as we hear, this wedding night as the, the new couple fall to their knees in prayer and, in fact, are delivered. The demon is driven away, uh, and this beautiful marriage is joined. But all of this uh, and some people get wide-eyed when you tell wedding couples the story of the demon uh, uh, and all of this. But, of course, the reason it is a wonderful selection is because we are familiar. We can very much ourselves think of times when we've been in desperate need. Perhaps we've been in great distress or sorrow and we literally fall to our knees in prayer. And for us, it's we don't understand what God is doing. We can't see the outcome. Our eyes are just lifted to the heavens. And we make an earnest prayer, and then suddenly everything turns out. That can be our experience in prayer. Sometimes our experience may be like, did God even listen to my prayer? Other times it's, wow, look how things turned out. But our sense is just almost like the prayer can feel sometimes like it's just going into the nothingness, into the air. When in fact, the story of the prayer right here is, is beautifully illustrated in the context of God's providence working to answer these prayers. He sees the needs of multiple people, and as the things prompt along and the intervention of angelic characters and, and disguise to, to help paths cross, solutions be found, and so for their experience, it's just, yes, it's a, it's a happy ending to the story, and yet God was very active in all of this, unbeknownst to them. And so it is for us. God's providence is not something that we see in its fullness. We can't. 
And yet, God, not only in his great wisdom and power, but in his love, is constantly working for our good, constantly working, setting things into motion, never in, never intervening against our free will. That's always the agency we possess, but constantly setting, almost teeing things up for us to be able to thrive in his love because he loves us so. And so for all those times that we don't know what our prayers are doing, today's readings and the readings this week are a beautiful reminder to us that God's providence is always unfolding, even if we don't see it. And so may we never cease to drop to our knees in prayer and pour out our hearts and our needs to God, who loves us and spares no good gift for his children. May God bless you all.